Any of those? Same here. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Everybody ready to worship? Amen. All right. Out of the um, Bruno Baptist hymn, the Rejoice, we're going to sing Peace Like a River, pages 542. Good song. 542. Yes, it is. Jesus, page 589. Hallelujah. Oh, 
Okay, now, okay, what a day that will be. What page? <laughs> what a day that will be. 693. Ah, there we go. Ah, see, I'm glad we all have a good sense of humor, right? <laughs> I know God had a good sense of humor when he made me. cousin that's 36 he's fighting for his life he had a hard stroke and they had to do emergency uh, surgery on his brain because his left brain was bleeding and um, then on top of that he got flu I don't I haven't heard anything this morning but guys remember my cousin in your prayer and my double cousins in your prayer, and his mom and everybody. Thank you.
stuff. So, okay, so we're still on this bike. We're going to stay on this one for a little while. You got it. You've done a good job. All right, let's open in prayer. And if you would turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. <clears throat> Father, we come to you, Lord. I thank you for this great morning. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I just, I don't know, I just feel like we're just on the edge of you just really, your hand really moving here at the church. You know that we've done all that we know to do. Probably failed at a lot of it. But Lord, we acknowledge you this morning. And this is a beautiful home here that you have, a beautiful house. We know that you reside in our spirit and in our heart, but I think that we have a responsibility to take care of this house also. We'd ask that you'd open this neighborhood up. We thank you this morning for Sister Sandy that's come with us. I'd ask blessings upon her lives, and if she has any needs, Lord, I'd ask that you would address those needs for her this morning. Father, selfishness tells me I want to see her again. I want her to come here to be a part of us, but I would yield that. I know it's got to be your perfect will. But I'd ask you for it anyway. Lord, we just gonna we're gonna preach your word this morning. I want you to, you know, I want you to take this and rearrange it and just use me uh, as a vessel this morning, Lord. I'm nobody. I want to acknowledge you. I want to lift you up this morning, Father, and your Son Jesus Christ and, and, your, and your Holy Spirit, Father. We give you the praise, we give you the honor this morning in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, Don, come up. Um, actually, the the week after I preached, that that few days after that, is uh, I located this. Okay, Ashley, I'm switching. All right, got this. Okay. Okay, we're we're good now. All right. Listen, God's arm has not been shortened, and it is almighty and it's still all powerful. That's why we wanted to read this. The key verse that we picked out this whole chapter was Numbers 11 and 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Moses was questioning God. In other words, Moses actually wasn't necessarily questioning God, but Moses was trying to take on more responsibility than what God really required him to do. Moses was worried how he was going to feed the 600,000 troops plus all the other people. God said to Moses, he said, Has my arm lost its power? And this is the New Living Translation. And he said, now you will see whether or not my word comes true. I'll tell you this morning that God's word always comes true. Amen? Amen. I'm not real good on the points. Lance is trying to train me on points. Points one, points two, points three. I'm not real good at it. I'm doing a little bit better. Uh, Lance lines his out really good. Mine crunched together, and then they spread out too far. I got two that's crunching together this morning. But point number one, I don't know how much you've gathered out of this story or this event in the Bible of, of Numbers 11, but Satan loves for us to complain. He loves it. And, you know, I'll just be honest with you. At one time or another, we're probably all guilty of that, Right? Satan loves for us to complain. Now, here's the difference. God loves for us to come to him with our concerns, but not necessarily in a complaint form. I think God is even willing to change a few things here and there to help us along. But the numbers, the first three verses of Numbers 11, uh, Ladon read, I picked out verse 3 to go a little further. It says, And after that, the area was known as Tiberia, which means the place of burning. 
because the fire from the Lord had burnt among them there. <clears throat> God was displeased because the camp had begun to complain. And their complaint was, what really got him, I think what really got God in this complaint, and you'll have to kind of review as I go, is not that they wanted to change in the menu, all right? I know they were tired of the manna. The manna was a beautiful thing that came to them, but in time they grew tired of it. And it probably wasn't necessarily that main thing that was getting to God, is they desired what got God here, I believe, God could easily change the menu. Actually, he does. But what got God so started off with them on the wrong foot was the fact that they desired to go back to what they used to have. They desired to go back to Egypt. I see a lot of that in the church. I see a lot of people get committed to God, get obedient to God, and begin to work for God. And then the next thing, you get to saying, well, Somebody's not here. Well, they're, they're sick today. Okay. The next thing, it's two or three weeks, and then it's a month, and then it's two or three months, and then it's six months, and then it's a year. And somebody says, hey, what happened? To well, I don't know. I believe many times it's not the case of them going somewhere else to church. It's just they quit coming because the things of the world drew them back, drew them back out from the things of God. God was furious about this. That's what he said. He said he set fire to many of them in the wilderness. You know, can I tell you something? God still has that ability today. Do you believe it? God can get our attention. God can get the world's attention. Give me one now. I'm going to go into this just a little. I'm going to back out of it pretty quick, though. Give me one person in the world right now that's guaranteed resistance against the coronavirus. One. This one's all I'm looking for. You got that name for me? I'm not telling you that God's doing this, but I'm also tell, not telling you that God's arm has been shortened either. In an interview with President Trump, I was watching that interview, and one of the reporters asked him, said, well, what about you, President Trump? What about your safety? Even the President of the United States is not safe from that. He said, well, the only consolation I have is we only have just a few numbers in the United States right now, and that man travels. And you reckon that man shakes a lot of hands? Let me tell you, God can reach us. And God can still get our attention, whether it's through the flu, through, whether it's through past viruses, through, whether it's through locusts flying all over the world, eating all the crops up that used to happen all the time in Egypt. God's arm has not been shortened. Is this because we choose to ignore God or the world chooses to ignore him? He can bring it back to us when he gets ready to. I'm not necessarily saying that's what's happening with this coronavirus. Don't take my words out of context. But I'm telling you, God can stop it too. Point number two. Satan loves discontentment. Numbers chapter 11 verses 4 through 10 talks about that. LeVon's done read it and I don't want to read the whole thing to you. But I did pick out verse 4. It says, then the foreign rabble who were traveling with the Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. Listen, we can't afford to get our, allow ourselves to get in a place that we crave the things of the world more than we do the things of God. We crave our own home more than we do God's home. We can talk about that in our heart. We can also talk about his physical house. Because God's arm has not been shortened. He said to Moses, do you think my arm has been shortened? I will show you that there's still power in my arm. And he reached down to those men and women that were complaining in the wilderness about 
Give, we're so tired of this manna. Lord, we have to gather it two or three times a day. It's just right there underneath our feet. We're just tripping over. It's all over us. And you put this stipulation that we got to eat it by the end of the day or it's going to ruin. It's too hard. Give us something else. Oh, back in Egypt, what did he say? Oh, we got cucumbers. I don't know, can you find that verse? Uh, Ashley talks about all their stuff that they had back in Egypt. Back in Egypt, we had we had all these different seeds, had all this different meat. We had cucumbers and lettuce and onions. I like good onion, don't you? We had all this stuff in Egypt. I don't know where it's at. I'm kind of off my deal. She'll find it here in a minute. That drew people away from God's house. It drew people away from God. And, he, and as they began to complain, they began to if you will, be discontented. And that's what got God fired up. It says, and the people of Israel also began to complain. There it is. We remember the fish. Oh, they had fish instead of that old manna. They had fish back in Egypt. And they had cucumbers and melons back in Egypt. And leeks. I used to know what that was at one time. I looked that up. I can't remember now. Like an onion. And they had onions and they had garlic. And all they had to do is work about 16 hours a day as hard as they could and they'd get all they wanted. Making them bricks. But here it was. Now God had them in the wilderness and give them a little bit of freedom. But yeah, they were a little bit restricted. God fed them that manna. But they got tired of it. They began to complain. They began to want to go back to the old way. They got discontented with the things of God. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they explained. Give us meat. We're tired of this wafer stuff. We're tired of the pancake looking thing. We gotta have some bacon to go with it. We gotta have some meat, some sausage, something with it. They explain. And this, by the way, is after God had provided them, as we've been saying all morning, an endless supply of manna. Numbers 11 and 7. I picked that verse out too. The manna looked like small. Corlander seeds and it was pale yellow like a gum resin sort of in Numbers 11 and 10 and Moses heard Moses heard all this he heard all of the, the, the family standing in the doorways Moses could hear he heard the family standing in the doorways the doorways of their tents whining would have been hard to hear through a tent he heard them whining. And it says, that, and the Lord became extremely angry. And also Moses got agitated. You ever been agitated? Moses himself got agitated. Believe this or not, Keith's not going to believe this. We're already on point three, Brother Keith. God knows our emotions. He knows them better than we know them. Okay? And he also understands our physical needs, what we need physically. He's the perfect balancer. He's the per perfect doctor. He's the perfect provider. He knows ahead of time. Numbers 11, verse 11 through 15, and Moses said to the Lord, Look what it did to Moses. He said, why are you treating me, your servant? I'm Moses, God. I'm your servant. You know how much I love you. Why are you treating me so harshly? It amazes me that Moses talked to God the way he did. It's kind of scary, but it, at the same time, it's beautiful to have a God that would allow one of his servants to talk to him the way Moses was. 
Moses wasn't candy coating anything. What Moses wasn't wearing a mask. Moses wasn't trying to be something he really wasn't. Moses was being himself. He had raw emotions there. These people, when they acted in the wilderness, they was just after self-ambition. They was just after what satisfied them at the time. They could care less about anybody else but their self. We'll just go back to Egypt and we'll dig around in the onions. We're tired of this man. Moses said, have mercy on me, God. He said, what did I do, God, to deserve the burdens of all of these people? I kind of understand it to some small, very small fraction. Do you understand it some, Lance? What did I do to deserve the burden of all these people? He said, did I give birth to them? Did I bring them into the world? He said, why did you tell me to carry them in my arms like a mother carries a nursing baby? How can I carry them to the land you swore to give their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all of these people? Did God ever say that Moses was to provide that meat? He never did really tell him that, did he? He said that the meat would be provided. But he, he goes on and he says, I just love this part. I probably should have just refrained to this one part. They keep whining to me saying, give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself any longer. The load is far too heavy. He told God this. Can you believe it? It's in scripture. It's, it's 11. 15. If this is how you intend to treat me, this is Moses talking to God. It sounds like it's God talking to Moses. He said, just go ahead and kill me. Sounds like something we studied about this morning in a way. Do me a favor and spare me this misery, God. Numbers 11, 20. It's another verse. Some verses I'm just picking out on top of this chapter. God says, I'm going to give these people the meat they're asking for. They went about it the wrong way. They went about it in a threat form to God. In other words, God, just send us back to Egypt and we can get what we need. We get a balanced diet going on here. We're tired of this manna. They could have very well come to God, even as Moses did, maybe, and said, God, help us. Forgive us, but do you have something else available? Can you help us with this? But that wasn't their attitude. God says you will eat it for a whole month until you gag and you get sick of it. He said, I'm going to give you what you ask. For you have rejected the Lord. See, that was the problem. It wasn't the meat or the manna. It was the rejection of God. He said, you've rejected the Lord who is here among you and you have whined to him. There's a difference between whining and praying. He said, you've whined to me. Moses has heard you, and I've heard you in the tent doors. Saying, why did we ever leave G Egypt? Wrong thing to say to God. Wrong thing to go back on God. Wrong thing to leave the church and go back into the world. Wrong thing to miss the world's ways. Wrong thing to try to substitute the world's program and, and give a balance to God's program. It doesn't work that way. It's either God's program or it's the world's program. You can't have one foot in. You can't have one foot out. It's all or none with God. God does not accept it no other way. That's what he said. Leave the subject of the world out of your vocabulary unless you're trying to do for others. He said, watch what he does. He said, who's here? Matter of fact, who's here among you? He said, uh, I'm going to, he, he said, 
costs about 70 men out here. I'm going to do something. I'm going to show you something. Moses responded to the Lord there, and he said, there are 600,000 foot soldiers here with me. And yet you say, I will give them meat for a whole month? <laughs> God, uh, uh, I don't think you realize how tough that is, what you just said. You, you're going to give, I've got, uh, God, <laughs> I, uh, just a minute now, uh, I don't think you quite understand my life. Now, this is what I need to do. And this is how I'm going to do it. You understand, God? Uh, I can't go that far, God. Now, I've got a limit right there. Now, you know I can't go over there because I've done putting my foot down. Moses said, how? In the world, am I going to feed 600? That's a lot of people. And them boys stay hungry. They're fighting and going on. They're hungry. That's just the foot soldiers. He said, I've got 600,000 foot soldiers here with me. And you say, I will give them meat for a whole month? He says, even God. Now, he's explaining this to God because God don't completely understand the program, right? Right? That's kind of how we, we have to do that every now and then. We have to set God aside and say, now, God, you don't. <laughs> um, let me, this is me. Let me explain to you my life here now. Uh, if you don't quite, uh, I know Brother Larry's trying to put us here, but you don't, he don't understand either. <laughs> yeah, Brother Larry don't understand. Oh, he's just going on your word. He don't understand the program. Brother Lance don't understand. They're just preaching the word. Come on now, let's get to reality. 600,000 foot soldiers. Got, this is Moses talking. This is his lead servant. This is the one that met him up on the mount. He said he saw, if anybody saw God to some extent, it was Moses. He seen the fire in the bush. Oh, they're just reading the word. They're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to say that. I can hear my Uncle Jake saying something like that. They're just saying what they're supposed to be saying. That don't apply to us. That don't apply to me. I've got... I can't cross that line, God. I can't... I can't feed 600,000 now. Listen, God, listen, listen to me now. Listen. Now, God, even if we butchered all of our flocks and herds, would that satisfy them? Would that be enough for them to eat? Even if we caught all the fish in the sea, would that be enough? Now, he's talking. <laughs> Wait a minute. Are y'all getting this? Or am I going to have to start all over? <laughs> now, I, I don't want you to forget the program here. He's talking to God. Amen. God, this ain't going to work. I'm telling you, that ain't going to work. We're going to have to kill all the cattle, plus we're going to have to get all the fish out of the sea. Now, guess what? We're in a mess. What's Moses doing? I can only go right here. And Moses is to the point. He's like, put my foot down. I'm going to put my foot down. You know, putting that foot down with God don't work very well. Have you ever tried it? It gets pretty rough. It's a rough ride on that old bull when he comes out of the sheep when you try to do that, huh? Now, I know what they're preaching, but this is what we're going to do. I know what God's word says, but this is what we're going to do. Because there's not enough meat to feed everybody. We'd have to catch all the fish in the sea to make it come to pass. Guilty? 
Sure. Sure. Then the Lord said to Moses, <laughs> listen, listen, if you don't enjoy this, I'm going to enjoy it. The only bad thing is I got to preach it. Listen to me. Look what God said. Whatever limitations you're putting on the Lord this morning, and I'm talking to Christian people too, most likely the, the lost for sure, but this is for you to help you mature this morning. Listen to what God said. He listened to God. He listened to Moses. I'm surprised he didn't kill the man. But he loved Moses. Moses had a special relationship with him. He listened to how he felt. He's reading his heart. He's reading his emotions. He knew his pulse rate at the time. He knew his body, his body temperature at the time Moses was pleading his life out to God. God knows everything. He knows what you're trying to do. He knows if it's, if it's real or if it's a game. He knows if you put limitations on him, if you've not. He said, that's so good. He said, God, in Numbers eleven twenty three. then the Lord said to Moses, can you, can you find that, Ashley? I'm going to have to slow down when we got here too early. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Moses is the Lord's hand waxed short <laughs> you know what he meant has my arm lost its power he said now you're going to see he said you will see whether or not my words come true I want you to note that, the strength of God's arm. What you do when you put limitations on God, when you put limitations on yourself and God's work, I'm only going to go this far. There's an imaginary line of me and that guy. And Brother Larry, I don't expect you to see it because you're just preaching God's work. Brother Lance, I don't expect you to see it because you're just preaching God's work. But me and God have got a special understanding we've got to lean it don't apply to nobody else but me in the world, but it applies to me. We've got us a limit. We're not going to go over that limit now. That's what Moses was saying. I can't do this. I can't. I'm give out. I've got too much on me. I'm give out. I can't feed six, 600,000 soldiers. You're changing the program up, God. It was working before, evidently. It wasn't, it got to where it wasn't because the people were going against God and his plan. And they were reminiscing back to Egypt. They was trying to squeeze some more of the world back in there. They was wanting to bring the world back into it. Wanting, they were remembering Egypt. He said the strength of, the, of God's arm has not been shortened. It's not been weakened. Numbers eleven twenty six. the two men. Watch this. Let me show you something. I was going to go to Lazarus, but I thought, no, this is going to be long enough. I'll stay with my program here. In the middle of this, God calls 70 men that he's going to ordain. He's going to anoint them to help Moses. Okay? I want you to get this picture. He said... Call out 70 men. These 70 men, I want you to bring them to the tabernacle. He says, bring them up here where I can ordain them to do, to help you, to do the work. Can I tell you something? Two of the men didn't even show up. But they were two of the ordained, pre-picked, anointed men that God wanted there. They didn't even bother to show up. It says in Numbers eleven twenty six, two men, Ildad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. Now, they may have had a valid reason to. I don't know. It don't tell us everything. But you would think those that was going to get anointed or those that was going to be a, a special thing laid upon their shoulders of responsibility, they'd have to be at the tabernacle for God to do it. 
two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, the elders we're talking about, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. And you tell me that God's hand is too short? It says, yet the Spirit rested upon them as well. <laughs> it floated down on that tabernacle and it sucked those men in and it, and it ordained those men and it anointed those men to do the work of God and it picked up two that were still in the camp. That's how long his arm is. That's how strong his arm is. If we're one to limit God with our own life, we limit God. It sucked those men up, those 68 men, and it grabbed a hold of those two still left in the camp. And look what happens. It says, yet the Spirit rested upon them as well. So they prophesied there in the camp. Uh, yeah. Now the Lord sent a wind that brought quail from the sea and let them fall all around the camp. So God answers that prayer, not exactly the way they wanted it, but he answered, for miles in every direction, there were quail flying around about three foot off the ground. I had to do some research on that, but that's what it kind of means. The quail were flying about three foot off the ground. Can you imagine that? I quail, well, I like them quail. Them quail's good. They're getting hard to come by anymore. But he, he brought these quail in from a wind and he let them fly about three foot off the ground. I can just kind of see them walking around. You just had to kind of reach and grab them. They kind of hit me in the knees, the thighs maybe, on the ankles there a little bit. Just reach and get you one. Three or four. Just three foot off the ground. I can remember one time going dove hunting with my son. Actually, it hadn't been that long ago. It's been within the last three years, I believe it is. It was in a field there in, uh, outside of Muskogee there a little ways. and We hadn't had a lot of luck. We'd, we'd got a couple of doves, and, and we just wasn't having much luck. And we were sitting there in the middle of the field. And I was give out, and Quaid was give out. And all of a sudden, on the other side of the field, this, un, this remarkable flock of what we thought were doves come in and lighted on the corner of the field. And they was thick. They was, it, the flock was probably as big as this church. And I looked at him, he looked at me, and I said, is them doves? He said, I think them's doves. So for the next hour and a half, we crawl and scoot and, and work our way over to these doves in this field. And we're on them. I can see them through the, the corn stalks walking around. I can't get a good picture of any of them, but I can see them moving. And I said, well, they're just right there. So we loaded up as much as we was allowed to load up. He said, what do you want to do, Dad? I said, I think all thing we need to do is just stand up. I said, you better be ready. We stood up. And them birds come up. They come over us, in us, around us. I could almost just scoop them up with my hand. And we got to shooting. And I hope I don't offend anybody. But we got to shooting among them birds. We didn't even aim. We just shooting up there in them. Now let's just say we got our limit just real quick, right then. But they weren't doves. <laughs> what were they, Randy? No, no, better, better. Pigeons. They were pigeons. They were pigeons. And a big old pig, pigeons. Yeah, they was pigeons. They'll do that. And... I can remember, I'll tell you this story. I'm about to wound out. I've done covered all three points anyway. But I can tell you this story. My grandma and grandpa's place on Wall Street in McAllister, Oklahoma, where I pretty much grew up. Northtown, Northtown uh, feed mill was set right behind my grandma's place. And she always had chickens and a humongous garden. And right behind her chicken pen was an alley. And on the other side of the alley, you can still <coughs> see the the feed mill in Northtown, if you go off 69, you go into Northtown in McAllister. That's pretty much where I was raised at. That feed mill still sits there. It's not a feed mill anymore. I think they've made it a flea market or something. But they would have corn spilt on the ground. There would be grain at that feed mill constantly. And the birds, any kind of bird you can imagine was at that feed mill. Well, these pigeons would roost in these 
this real high tin thing where they pull these big trucks in to unload the feed. They'd roost up in these little rafter deals, these pigeons would. And my brother, you got to know him, but he come over one time. He said, come on, bring your BB gun or your pellet gun. He said, we're going to go do something. And I was not probably nine years old, ten years old. And we go back to the feed mill and Danny shoots two or three of those pigeons. You know, they're just, they're so thick. Actually, believe this or not, the McAllister Police Department, once a year, they had to stop it. But the pigeons got so bad in Northtown that they would actually, the McAllister Police Department, civil service, and a lot of those guys like that would come in and shoot so many of those pigeons just right in the street there, just shoot them off the buildings and stuff. And uh, to try to keep the population down, keep the disease down. Anyway, we killed us three or four pigeons. We took them back. I said, what are you going to do with them pigeons? Did you know he uh, cleaned those pigeons? There, my grandma. And we ate those pigeons. And that's some of the best eaten bird that I have ever ate in my life. Of course, those pigeons had been raised on pure grain. I don't know why I'm telling you all that, but the thing is, they had plenty. And it was good. Closing, Christy, if you want to come on up. <clears throat> so the people went out and they caught the quail all that day and throughout the night and all the next day. No one gathered less than 50 bushels. That's a lot of quail. They spread the quail all around the camp to dry. So that place was called Kabroth Hath Bedai. And that's probably not right. But which means... Look at here. You know what? You know what God named that place? Where that quail come in? Graves of gluttony. Graves of gluttony. See, the problem was people had gluttony in their hearts. They wanted something other than what God had offered them. They were going back to the world. They were going back to the memory in the world of how good they had and how much freedom they had, if you will, to the extent they could eat all these different things that was provided to them. Because they there they buried the people who had craved meat from Egypt. God's word will come to pass. And he said that they, they ate that until it come out their nostrils. Right. Satan loves for us to complain. Satan loves for us to be discontented. I didn't put this in here, but Satan loves for us to draw a line with God. You know what I mean? You got to watch Brother Larry and Brother Lance because they're just trying to get us to move forward in the Lord. Right, Lance? They're just, wow, they're just preaching God's word. Listen, that's what we need. We need to continue to move forward in the Lord. We need to take down restrictions that we put up ourselves with God. We need to say, God, whatever it is that you'd have us to do, we'll do it. I'll not restrict myself from anything to do with your word. And I'll not want, want to, to lust on going back into the world to receive the things that don't seem like I can have here where I'm at. But what you have here is better than what you have there. God does know our emotional and our physical needs. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> and God's word will come to pass. There was no reason for Moses to fret, but you can understand he was overloaded. And he did what he should do. Instead of talking to somebody else about it, all about this and all about that, he went to God, and he, if he didn't, if he didn't lay it on the line like it was, nobody did. And God respected that, and He honored that. So, if you have a need here this morning, and if this touched you in some way, the ones I don't think come over really well. That seems like that's the ones that do the best. The ones you think that you really affect people with it doesn't seem like they're near as affected so I, I